right, we're getting ready to get started with our Bible study tonight. Got another 2023 New Year's Bible study for you. Wow, what a week we had around here. Where's all the Minnesota people? There's a lot of people here from Minnesota. There's the leaders of the Minnesota cult. We've been invaded by people from Minnesota. This is a nice time to visit here. Weather is great. Praise God. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't know why, but the older I get, I seem to have a little bit more of an issue of memorizing, remembering things. Uh, hey, I wanted to uh, start before we get going here. I get these things in the mail. You've seen them before. Here's Chris Smith. They uh, notify everybody in the neighborhood when a sex sex uh, conviction moves in. Sex pervert. Here he is, Chris Smith. And uh, here's another one here, Sean McGinnis. This is him right there. I have a picture of him. Here's uh, Gerald Ferguson right here. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to pray for these guys. I know what causes uh, sexual perversion. I used to have major lust demons when I was living in sin. Not a pretty sight, I'll tell you that. But these guys got lust demons on steroids. Much worse than the ones I had. So, but it's, that's not a problem for the Holy Ghost. Uh, he has no problem. So, Father, I want to lift up these three guys here. I know they're living lives of misery and sorrow. I'm sorry about what they did. I pray for every person they hurt that you will go save them and bless them. And I pray for them that you bring them here. I want to see them down here at this altar right here getting healed and delivered from lust demons. And I know they've also got fear and rejection demons, so I want all of them out right down here at this altar, and I ask you, Lord, to forgive them for what they did. Have mercy on their souls. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I love sex perverts. I wish I had a whole room full of them. Happy to go see them. Got no problem with it at all. Because Father loves sex perverts. He despises sexual perversion, okay, so that we got to get repentance for that. But uh, he can heal any person with a broken heart. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, fantastic. He's something. The next seminar, part three, divine healing, is uh, January 27th. The best part of the services every week, of course, are the announcements. And... Um, Here's my YouTube teaching channel. You just go there, youtube.com slash house of feeling AZ and 400 teaching, teachings right there. <laughs> and quite, quite a bit. Wow, I don't know how I did it. Uh, here's our radio programs. You can catch them on three platforms there, pandora.com. You can uh, go to omni.fm and... Uh, Uh, the last one, well, it's, I forgot to put the other one up there. Okay. Here's, uh, if you'd like to help the ministry and you happen to shop at Amazon like my wife does, just go to smileamazon.com. Wouldn't recommend you spend the kind of money my wife does. Uh, my wife's in the office. She can't hear me, but uh, this Amazon thing is weird. She orders, let's say she orders 10 things. We take back about seven of them. <laughs> Every other day, I'm at the UPS. Weird. How's that work? But she uses SmileAmazon.com, so that they send me a check. I think twice a year from Amazon. They'll pay. They'll pay us if you buy something there. You just put it on our charity name. Bang. We're in. Do you speak any of these languages at the top? You can order the miracle list. This is a step-by-step -step guide to healing and deliverance. It works 100% of the time. We have one for mentally ill Christians and another one for troubled Christians. 
I mail out about a dozen of these a week, thereabouts. There's my uh, teaching uh, flash drive, 18 classes. And uh, if you want to get into the healing and deliverance ministry, I would not uh, take that lightly. <laughs> Don't just jump into this ministry. I would pray about it first. Whew. Uh, this is uh, not an easy ministry to be in. And uh, the disappointing thing is I didn't get all the fame and glory I was expecting. <laughs> Missed out on that. Uh, but it is a great ministry of being a servant. If you like, if you got a servant's heart, this is a good ministry for you. If, if you don't, please don't get into the deliverance ministry. There's your future, Seven Churches of Revelation. The flash drive is in the bookstore. Thursday night's our best service of the week. This is our deliverance service with Brother Rick and the ministry team. I guess uh, the devil got his face kicked in last night, so I heard a lot of good reports from it, so... Well, as usual, every week's the same. You can download our app on tithely.com. If you want to donate by telephone, you can donate in these boxes on the door there. As you leave, thank you for your donations. And you can donate off the website on the PayPal button. The fourth Saturday of every month in the small sanctuary behind me, I have a teaching class on deliverance and healing. You'll find that interesting. Starts at noon. The Miracle List Support Group. Tuesday nights with Julie. And uh, I believe next Tuesday is uh, the class. It's on every other Tuesday. Next Tuesday night. Walk-ins welcome. 6.30 p.m. Okay. There's my radio schedule. Been on the radio in Maricopa County for February, would be my 21st year. That's a long time. Man, I don't know how I did all those shows. It's weird. Time flies when you're having a good time. YouTubers, I want you to open up an ambush team in your church. You get two or three people together, and then you start picking off the sick people. And then your ministry will start growing, word of mouth will spread, and you'll have all kinds of people lining up to get to you. And then uh, the pastoral staff will find out about it, and then you'll get, you'll get kicked out. And uh, that's a sign from God that you're then to expand into a broader, deeper ministry. Whenever you get kicked out of a church, that's always a good sign. You are, that's a promotion. Start your own church, start your home, whatever it is. Whenever you get kicked out, that's a green light to take off. Happened to me years ago. I kind of got the boot. I know what you're thinking. Those, those people nuts? Yeah. They were. My personality, something obviously you wouldn't want to get rid of. <laughs> Stupid. Those are my three books, Satan, Healing, and... Uh, Mental illness in the bookstore. And uh, this is my uh, podcast every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. You can catch me on twitch.tv. You put in that code there. Or you can go catch me on Facebook. I broadcast on there Saturday, Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock Mountain Time, Arizona time. There's a Rick's Zoom service. It's on uh, every Wednesday at 6 o'clock Arizona and Mountain time. Send me an email and I'll send you the code and the ID and so on. No problemo. If you want to uh, join uh, the, uh, if you want to join a group, if you have a home group or something and you need a Zoom meeting, I'd be happy to join you and do some teaching or deliverance, what have you. I'm doing two or three of these a month. Okay, so just contact me and we'll set up the group and we'll be ready to go. Our Thursday and Friday night broadcasts are here and uh, they're rebroadcast here and okay hey I want to teach you something tonight 
Uh, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but God doesn't show up very much. Uh, nationwide, all across America, there doesn't seem to be much activity that God is doing. And there's a reason for that, particularly in church. He doesn't show up there much, very much either. And the, the reason for that is this. You've got to have an expectation to get a miracle. And people don't normally have that. There's two kinds of expectations, as you know. This isn't it. The Holy Ghost is not showing up to that church service. Okay? It's not going to happen. If you showed up here tonight like these people, uh, we're not going to be able to help you. Okay? There's nothing that's going to happen because I checked myself over and I'm fresh out of healing powers. I don't have any healing powers. Yeah. I, I, if I could heal you, I would. Yeah, I'm a nice guy. But I don't have any ability to heal anybody, nor, to, nor can I deliver them, nor can I help them that much. I, I can give you some general information, I guess, but you know, I am flat out of nothing. As Catherine Kuhlman once said, I don't have a thing. Yeah. Uh, if you showed up here and you don't, and you have this kind of a attitude, uh, there's nothing can be done. You are spiritually screwed. Uh, this isn't going to work either. All right, now, this is the opposite of having expectations when you go somewhere. But take a look at this, Romans chapter 12. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation and continuing instant in prayer. Okay, hope. What is that? That is el pis, Greek word. It means to uh, anticipate something's going to happen. I do. I have hope. I hope when I die, I'm going to transition from here to heaven. That's a hope. Hope is futuristic. It's not present tense. It's future tense. Uh, you can have hope in the rapture. You can have hope that your kids are going to get healed. You can have like, oh, there's all kinds of things to hope for. And that is something you are anticipating is going to happen in the future. Okay? Well, that isn't quite good enough. You've got to have, you got to have an expectation, which is a little different from hope. Expectation is the sense it's about to happen now. Okay? You can anticipate something happening down the road, but the thing that triggers it now is your expectation of it. That's how it works. It says faith is the hypothesis, the foundation of things. Elpizo, that's the verb for elpis, hope. It's the foundation for your hopes, your anticipations, everything you anticipate sets on this foundation of pistis. Pistis is the Greek word for faith. It means to believe without doubting and with no unbelief. So people who have pure pistis routinely see miracles. People who have contaminated pistis struggle. Doubt and unbelief mixed in with pistis contaminates it. And so that's why uh, evangelists are so popular because they travel around preaching, faith healers, and they see a lot of people healed. And people go to them. Why? Because they have less doubt and less unbelief than going to see their pastor or their church. Or someone that they're used to seeing. So traveling evangelists tend to have more results than pastors and people in the church. Okay? Pistis, with no contaminant in it, always gets a miracle. When you mix in doubt and unbelief, contaminates it and it doesn't work. People who have pure pistis, for example, like Wigglesworth, miracles were routine. He had no doubt 
He had no unbelief. I don't have pistis at that level myself. Yep. What's that mean? I have more unbelief and doubt mixed in with my pistis than Wigglesworth did. So, so the results are commensurate. Correct? It's easy to see. That's how the system works. What system? The miracle system. Miracles are based on pistis. Pure pistis always works. Contaminated pistis is mixed. You get failures, partials, confusion. What should I be praying? Well, every minister would tell you you got to pray and read God's word and increase your faith. And they're half right. What did they miss? You have to remove the unbelief and the doubt. It's twofold. If you have trouble getting your prayers answered and you don't see signs and wonders and miracles and so on, you got to do two things. You must increase your faith and remove the doubt. If you increase your faith and don't remove the doubt, doesn't work. Now, pistis is the hypostasis, the foundation that you build the house on of all your anticipations, your hopes. It's the elenkos, the proof of things you cannot see. If you can't see something, you can't touch it, you have no five senses, that proves it doesn't exist. However, with pistis, you know what exists, the positive of it. But contaminated pistis doesn't work because doubt comes in, which leads to unbelief and it blocks. Your miracle. Powerful faith healers have very limited contamination in their pistis. It's pretty clear. For example, Wigglesworth had no had no uh, faith for you know other things in Christianity like. Fundraising, you know. He would they would ask him, Hey, will you come pray for our church and we need the finances? No, I'll pray. No, I'll pray for it here. And he he would you know. No Christian has pit pure pistis for everything. Nobody does. Nobody ever ever has, with one exception. Jesus. Not everybody's pistis works on everything, correct? Because not everybody has pure pistis and believes every single single thing. For example, ministers typically have purer pistis for others than they do themselves. It's some ministers over there were amening me, but they have tough time praying for themselves to be healed, but an easy time praying for others to be healed. That's true in the deliverance ministry. Many ministers have a bang up time casting demons out of those people, 
but struggle to get them out of themselves See that so nobody has perfect round the horn pistis nobody has it Okay, that's not a discouraging thing don't get discouraged. Hey, whatever your area is Go ahead and kill it That's what you're called to do Nobody has perfect pistis for everything Right Reinhard Bonnke had enormous pistis for missionary work remember him Tremendous but him him teaching the nursery class his pistis would like tank Nobody has perfect pistis for everything Ellen cost is a proof of what you can't see okay? Well that works with deliverance you can't see demons Generally speaking you see them in your dreams here and there and sometimes you see them in your room at night There's a shadowy thing standing there in the corner or you're laying in bed at night and some you feel something sit on the end of the bed Or some nights you're laying there and something's hovering over you remember those nights don't raise your hands The things hanging over you or you can feel a sense or pressure on you and you kind of wake up and You can't move you're trying to talk and you can't get it out remember that Yeah, don't raise your hand Yeah people that have faith for deliverance for example don't need to see them You know we, we see people delivered all the time around here. I, I never see any of the demons. I don't want to see them I heard they're ugly and uh, I'm not trying to be cruel, but you know I, I see enough ugliness anyway I've been a counselor for 40 years and most of the people that come in my office are not GQ. Okay, so not, It's not always a pretty sight in my business Ooh. There's bad Bad expectations too, right? Boy, the demons love this, don't they? Don't they? Oh man, it, this works. It's supernatural. It supernaturally works. Even sinners know this works. Uh, Tony Robbins knows this works. Everybody knows that how you think influences what you believe and how you feel in your soul. And the demons see it and if you fear something oh my god this is gonna happen my kids gonna get this I'm gonna get sick well it's gonna be a, the finances are not oh and the hospital is gonna if you if they sense you fear something they can make that thing come true you know why fear is the polar opposite of pistis if you're fearing something that proves your pistis is contaminated. Hundred percent of the time, anyone who fears something, their faith is low. Fear wipes out faith. And if you fear something, the devil can bring it on you. I gotta hope I don't. I don't hope I don't have a heart attack. My God, I can't. Guess what? They heard you say that. They heard you say that. Yeah, it happened to Job. Job loved the Lord. He was a faithful man of God. He was a great one, no question. But he had this terrible fear about his family. He was always sacrificing for them and praying to God to forgive them for sins known and unknown and he was always sacrificing for his kids. Oh my God, maybe my kids sinned today. Maybe my, what happened? Guess what happened? Yeah. It was a disaster. Guess what happened to this guy? The rich young ruler came to Jesus and he had expectations that were faulty. He came to Jesus expecting to be justified. Why? Because in his mind, he had got all the religious things, all the boxes checked. 
religious religion 101 honor your mother tithe click 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 and then he ran into Jesus who did what <clears throat> he said you're lacking one thing oops that he didn't want to hear ouch you're lacking one thing yeah. you wouldn't believe how prevalent that is in the deliverance ministry because these demons will all come out but then these are left here and those that are left are holding on to something in that person some kind of negative thought some kind of negative emotion some kind of false belief some kind of deception something's going on in the person and they want you to wave a magic wand over them and fix that see and we can't do that we have to help the person kind of explore that thing to find out what is that thing that's blocking the last batch from coming out once you find it they come right out no problem but sometimes finding it is a challenge i don't know what's wrong well, this guy found it here. He went away lupeo, very sad, downcast. Why? Uh, Katama, he had a large estate. He had money, he had property, he had everything. And Jesus told him what? Why don't you go sell all this stuff and you'll have these treasures, great ones in heaven. You've got, you've got a lot of treasure here. But that compared to this, it's no comparison. So he was appealing to the guy's desire for an estate, but it was a different kind of estate. And the guy didn't want it. He didn't want to lose this estate for that one. And so he left sad. Why? Well, he had, he had misguided expectations. There are some good expectations too, aren't they? Yeah, here it is. There sat a certain man in Lystra. He was impotent. Adunatus means he wasn't able to walk. And his feet, he had a problem with his feet. And it looks like uh, he limped around all the time. And it looks like it was congenital because he had it from his mother's womb. And it says, Paul, who was speaking uh, and steadfastly looking at him, he, edu, he saw that the guy had faith to be healed. Now this section of text doesn't, doesn't tell you what he saw. So he got some indication that this guy was, had pure pistis. And the guy was expecting to be healed. And then when Paul saw that, it was easy to finish off the miracle. Miracles are easy for people who have pistis that doesn't have unbelief and doesn't have doubt contaminated in. Water is easy to drink if there's not a drop of arsenic in it. One drop of arsenic in the gallon of not drinking it. We've got a lot of chemists here tonight. And so you can see here how easy miracles are when people don't doubt. Notice that? Doubt is a killer, isn't it? <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, now listen, stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. In America, Christianity did the opposite. They said, you know, after you get saved, we're going to put you into the church system. Saved, church, Sunday school, church attendance, uh, filled with the Spirit, water baptism. Okay, you're ready for ministry. Oh, man. Go to Bible college. Go to a seminar. No, that's not, not how it works. Before you go in the ministry, you've got to get supernatural power from God. John baptized with water. You'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And you will receive dunamis, supernatural power, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When you're born again, your spirit man is saved and you receive the Holy Spirit. Every born again Christian has the Holy Spirit. By definition, Romans 8, 
if you don't have the Holy Spirit, that means you're not saved. So if you know a Christian who has zero spiritual fruit, that person's probably not born again. If they have religious fruit, it doesn't matter. Okay, so let's say that uh, you're feeding the homeless and you're cleaning out the church and you're wiping down the church bathroom. Okay, those are good things. God bless you for that. But Jesus was talking about by their fruits you will know them. Spiritual fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is spiritual fruit. See? Me loaning you 10 bucks may not be spiritual. It could be, but it doesn't prove it. Okay? So you've got to have dunamis power before you go into the ministry. Ouch! The opposite is true in America. This pastor, that one, this one, that one, this one. They all have churches and don't have this. What happens then? The people suffer. The people come to the church. It's supposed to be a hospital, and it turns into a morgue. Because they go there, and the dunamis is not. Where's the, where's the Holy Ghost? Where's the power? Well, you got the cart in front of the horse. You, you went to Bible college. You went to seminary. Then you got a certificate, or you did it online. I'm a minister. Click, print. <laughs> but Jesus said, no, do that after you're filled with dunamis. Do this first. The disciples were not to leave Jerusalem and do any ministry work until they got dunamis. Hmm. Hello? This is the non-popular part of the teaching. Uh, just hang in there. It'll be over. As you can see here, here's the, tr here's the key to miracles right here. You have the dunamis here. That's the stick of dynamite there. And then you have an expectation and as anticipation there. And that's what lights the fuse. Sometimes you've got to demonstrate it so others can see it, right? Remember the story of Jacob. Yeah. He took this angel and clung to him like a barnacle. He would not let go. Yeah. In America and Christianity, uh, oh God, yeah. any kind of adversity pops up and it's time to quit praying. As soon as a trial pops up, oh God, it's forsaken me. As soon as it gets a little tough, the tough don't get going. They just sit down and uh. at some point in time, you've got to care about something enough to persevere. Wow, what a statement. At some point in time, spiritually, you've got to care about something enough to persevere. And Jacob did. And he went from what? Uh, he went from being uh, Jacob. Jacob is a heel catcher. He went to Israel, the prince of God. Yeah. How do you, how do you go from being a heel catcher? Hey, can I, can I ride on your coattails? Can I kiss your butt for a couple hours? Now, how do you go from that to being a prince of God? Well, it takes perseverance. Okay, that's a four-letter word to Christians. But I'm sorry, there's no way to get out of it. There isn't any way to get out of it. There's no way. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried to get out of it. I tried to figure it out. There must be some way to get something without having to do anything for it. Well, that sometimes that works if you hit the lottery. You ever at Circle K with a scratch off? Do they have Circle K in Minnesota? Yeah, Circle K. There you go. You buy the ticket there, and, the, and you're, you're in line. You, you got a drink. You got the beef jerky here. You're in line. The guy in front of you just got a lottery ticket. You ever been there? And uh, he's not moving. He, I got the jerky and the drink. I'm behind the guy, and I got to wait. To see if this poor sucker 
what, they're scratching it right in front of me. And I went, now, I'm not saying anything because I'm trying to be polite. And he doesn't know I'm in back there because he's oblivious. Because he's looking for the lottery. And his anticipation and expectation is high. And mine, standing behind him, is dropping. <laughs> and then the slumped shoulders, then I know I'm, yeah, he's done. Then I move up and... I get out my credit card You put it in the thing right it doesn't work you pull it back out You look at it. And you realize you put it in upside down. I Turn it around When I was younger. I used to put them in no problem now. It can go in anyway. I got to double check it I Pull it out. It gives a check on there. You push the thing is that is this amount? Okay, you push it Now I'm expecting that to work it does work. My expectation, expectation went up when this guy lost his money and left. <laughs> Correct? That's how it works. You cannot become a prince of God without fighting your way through. There's no way to do it. It can't be done. You got to get it through your thick skull, as Grandpa used to say. You got to push it. He said, you have power with God and men, and you have prevailed. Hallelujah. Expectation can be diversified. A certain lame man came from his mother's womb. He was carried there and laid daily at the gate of the temple. Another guy with a congenital foot disability, lower extremity disability. And he's there at the temple called Beautiful to ask alms. Why are they doing that? Well, they had no social security, no aid to dependent children, no welfare. If you were poor or you were disabled back then, you had to, you got to beg. That was the only way to survive. In this particular case, your family would help you. They would pick you up, carry you to the spot. They wanted you to take money in, pop you down, see you tonight. Then they would go to work, right? Well, this guy's standing there and he's sitting there and he's begging for money. He's got a pottery pot, right? And he's right here. Here. See the eastern gate there? It's all uh, centuries ago they plugged it up. And this is where the gate that Jesus comes. Through the eastern gate at the second coming, he comes through this gate here. Right through there. And some of you may be there when it happens. I don't know. I don't know how that works, but he's going through that gate. You can get to this gate on the other side through the Temple Mount. There's the Mosque of Omar for the Muslims, the third, uh, third most holy site of, the, of Islam is right there. Right? You've seen this before? And there's, there's the gate that, Paul, that, that uh, Peter was at right there. Okay? And, and uh, he saw Peter and John going to the temple. He asked for money, and Peter looked at him and said, look on us. The guy looks over expecting to receive something. I was expecting to check out when his shoulders dropped. I knew the ticket was no good when you get that sink. Oh, I was expecting to get my. He's expecting to get a lottery ticket here. He doesn't get it, but he gets something else. Okay. What's going on here now? Peter has high expectations. Okay, somebody's got to have some expectations here to get a miracle from God, and this is exactly what happened. This guy got healed. This is the second case of lower extremity disability was mentioned in the Book of Acts. Got healed, and now he expects it so much he reaches down, he grabs this guy, and he yanks him up. Like Wigglesworth used to. He'd just pull him out of the chair. And the guy was healed. And then uh, they made a bunch of songs about this right here. Walking and leaping and praising God. You ever hear that song? Nobody ever had a hymnal. Well, they used to have hymnals. You know what a hymnal was? Well, that was a book they used to have in churches years ago. And it had a bunch of songs in it about that thing. 
and the, the worship leader, they don't have that now. Now it's, now they got laser shows and different things, but <laughs> fog machines. But they used to have hymnals, and you, they would say, now turn to 137, you turn, and then you would sing it. Remember that? Yeah. Nobody? Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Well, this is, this is one of the songs right here. Here it is. Turn to that one. It was, I think it was 239, and you sit and sing at walking and leaping and praising God. Walking. See, we would sing that. Nobody ever walked and leaped, but I mean, we would still sing it anyway. <laughs> You've got to have anticipation to get a miracle from God. And when you expect something, God makes a move. People who expect him to do something are the ones that see him do something. People who don't expect anything don't see anything. Okay? What's the danger of being in church for too long? What's the danger of it? Oh, geez, it's horrible. You know what's going to happen before you get there. That's bad. If you know what's going to happen in your church before you get there, we're in trouble. Why? Well, because you become desensitized to the system. You've been in it too long. Here's what we do. It starts here. We sing here. There's a testimony there. Then there's some announcements. And then uh, there's a guest speaker. Then there's some prayer at the end. Then, boop, Wendy's. And what's wrong with that? A lot of things. But if you do that 400 times, you don't need to be there to do that anymore. You follow? Nobody's expecting anything to happen. Other than an announcement, pre a preaching, prayer at the end. You know what's happening, right? You've been there before. Okay? That's what I like about Circle K. You never know what's going to happen in there. <laughs> you ever been in a Circle K? It looks like a carnival. Nothing. People running around the corner. Kids diving down the aisle. Somebody holding the place up. It's fabulous. You go to church, you don't get that. You get the same routine the whole time and what's the end result of it virtually nothing why nobody expects this system to change I've been there 50 times this is how we do it you ever been in a Lutheran church oh. I mean, you can go in there blind and know exactly what's going to happen in the next 45 minutes. Literally. Literally. It's, and in fact, if you open up your, what do they call the thing? The thing they get, program. Church program. See, if you open up the program, it's, it's got the song in there. You don't even need a hymnal anymore. You, Then it says at the end, right here on the program, doxology. You know what a doxology is? Yeah, that's a death knell for a church. If you see doxology in a program, you better get out of there. I guarantee you nothing's going to happen. Why? Because the minister there didn't tarry in Jerusalem. To get the dunamis, he went to a seminary and got an education, and then they gave him a certificate, and then he was appointed to that church. We have an opening over here. You go there. Oh, okay. Nothing. Nothing. Why? Nobody expects anything to happen. Nobody. <laughs> You know the Lutheran Church is in America is fading out now. You know why? They're all my age or older. Everybody at the Lutheran Church is old. Yeah, they all look like me. If you don't have a vibrant youth program, 
your, your church is not going to last. You got to have replacements. See, you got a bunch of Christian losers running the show. You got to train other losers to replace them. If you don't have backup losers, you can't replace the front line. And Lutherans don't have any more losers. They're running out of them. Somebody needs to step up in this church system and show up someday at a Lutheran church with some Holy Ghost expectations. Did he just say that? Did he? Oh my God, I've got diarrhea. Anticipation triggers something, a person, the Holy Ghost. Cornelius is praying to God, and the good Lord says, Cornelius, I like you. Listen, go get this Peter guy. Bring him over here. He does it immediately. Why? He's expecting something. He's, he's got anticipation. He's not in church. He's at home. This, this guy doesn't go to church. He has church here. That's the real church right here. Oh, this is not a good message, is it? So they rush to get Peter. Hey, load the horses. You guys go. You three go. Go get him. Bring him back here. I'll do that. Oh, well, Peter's prejudice. He's prejudiced. So the Holy Ghost got to fix him. Well, there it comes, down through the thing. He looks on there. Oh, my gosh. There's some great food over here. Oh, gosh, there's lizards over here. God tells him, eat that. Go ahead. I'm not going to eat a bunch of lizards. What are you, nuts? Jews don't eat lizards. Wait a minute. If I tell you the lizard is clean, you don't question anything I say. On Christianity in America, oh, everything God says is up for a debate. Got to have a board meeting. Did he really say that? Oh, wow, what a disgrace. It ha Peter didn't get it. It happened again. He still didn't get it. That's how ingrained and satanic religion is. You can't get past it. Three supernatural miracles. <sighs> Peter, there's some turtles. There's snakes. There's lizards. Enjoy. They're clean. Wow. Okay. Here's a knock at the door. Turtle buffet here. Knock behind him. Hey. The Holy Ghost says, hey, there's some guys down there. Go with them. God's a great God. Peter shows up at Cornelius' house. What's he do? He walks into a bunch of Gentiles. He's prejudiced. He's a racist. God had to Teach him, hey, there's no such thing as race in Christianity. It doesn't exist. Why is that? If you remove the body, everybody looks the same. Your inner man looks the same. Everybody has a spirit, a soul, a mind, a conscience. There's no race anymore. There's no such thing as race. Nobody cares about it. Or you shouldn't care about it. Race means nothing. He said, hey, these, these Gentiles over here, go, go tell them about Jesus. He's standing there preaching about Jesus. He doesn't even finish his sermon. <laughs> what happens? The Holy Ghost falls. Stand up, Cornelius. I'm just a man. He walks in there. There's a bunch of Gentiles in there. Oh, my God. This is sin right there. You're not allowed to go in the house and eat with a Gentile, right? Yeah. He says, hey, we're expecting you to tell us something. We are expecting a miracle. Nobody else in the neighborhood got a miracle that day. None of the other Gentiles got any miracles. You know why? They didn't expect one. You know why you're not getting a miracle? Because you're not expecting it. Miracles don't come to people who have no expectations. Oh, darn. Isn't there any way to cheat this system? No. 
If there was, I'd, I'd share it with you. I would show you how I beat it. I would. I didn't beat it. I couldn't beat it. You can't beat it. God responds to people who expect him to do something. You ever been to a mall? Yeah, I, I've been to a few over the years. I go into the food court usually. My wife goes shopping for different things. I sit in the food court. I get something to drink. Sometimes I'll get uh, Panda Express. You ever eaten there? Oh, wow, that, that's good. And I look around, I do people watching. I sit there, I can't stand shopping. It's something's wrong with me. I can't. I can't go in the store. I get anything. I, I can't do that. So my wife, for some reason, feels divinely comfortable with it. She floats into the stores and pulls things off the racks and takes them home. And I am in the food court looking around. Okay, While I'm sitting there at the food court, I, I don't expect God to do any miracles. It's one of my uh, pistis doubts. When I'm sitting in the food court eating the Panda Express, I don't, I'm not expecting uh, a resurrection or anything. Uh, what I'm expecting is to survive this trip to the mall. <laughs> well, God tailors his miracles around your expectations. I never get a miracle at Panda Express because I'm not expecting one. I am expecting some things there. The orange chickens. <laughs> I'm expecting it to be delicious. I am. I'm not expecting God to move supernaturally while I'm standing in the line for Panda Express. And guess what? God fulfills my expectations. He doesn't do a thing. Nothing. He does nothing. Panda Express. Nothing. My wife expects to buy some things. And guess what? Her expectations are fulfilled. Hi. Right. Can we take most of this back next week? Oh, oh, I get a sinking feeling. I got sick in my gut. Sicknesses. When she buys something, I expect to return it. Why are we returning that? Uh, it didn't work. I don't know. It just doesn't work right. Yeah, I could have told you that at the food court. I have giftings. <laughs> Cornelius was expecting to get a miracle from God, and nobody in the neighborhood was expecting anything. And guess who got the miracle? Cornelius got it, and nobody in the neighborhood got a miracle. Not one person. They were so excited and their expectation was so high that during the sermon, Peter doesn't even get to finish it. Right in the middle of the sermon, the Holy Ghost interrupts him, poof, drops on everybody. I'll never forget that happened to me in Tucson one time. Do you remember that service in Tucson? I was in the middle of a spectacular teaching, uh, not like tonight, but I was really on my game then. And <laughs> this, it was unbelievable. I was hitting everything. The slides were, were going perfectly. I, I loaded up the correct teaching. This one's not the right one, but the other one, that one was the right one. And right in the middle of it, well, I, I don't even remember what subject I was on, bloop, he drops. And I go, whoa. 
I said, I'm going to stop my teaching now. The Holy Ghost starting to move. Whenever that happens, I just quit doing what I'm doing and go with that. And it lasted. Do you remember that service? Was anybody in that service? <clears throat> it just He just swept right through the uh, hotel room. <clears throat> like that. Unbelievable. I just quit doing what I was doing. Well, that's what happened to Peter here. These people, expectation was so high, they can't even stand to hear you preach too long. If they want to hear you keep preaching, there's probably a problem at your church. Your expectations may need innovation. Everybody knows this story. These guys brought this paralyzed guy to Jesus. And they couldn't get in because of the crowd. You remember the story. And their expectations were like this. Wow. Way up there. They carted this disabled man to the service. That's a lot. That's impressive. That is telling me the, the family members, I don't know about the kid, but the family members had high expectations because they're carting him down there on a cot. Paraluticus is a Greek word. It means to have a spinal cord injury. The guy couldn't walk. He was either a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. And they're carting him down there. So that's high expectations, right? Well, they get there and they can't get in. And in their normal circumstances at church, you would just quit. Oh, gee, well, we tried. Go back home. No, these guys were innovators. Okay? They tried a different route. In my monthly deliverance class, sometimes I teach about how to do altar work. And whenever I have an altar call, I leave my mic on so that my YouTube friends can hear what's going on. Because sometimes I say stuff that's good and helps. Sometimes I say stuff bad that doesn't help. So I want them to hear that. So they, A, don't repeat what I screwed up, but repeat what I did was right. Right? Yeah. you got to have a, a lower type ego to do that. <laughs> because that's, sometimes if you screw up, it's embarrassing. Okay? And just a little tip, this is an aside. Ministers and preachers are very sensitive about that. Very sensitive. They do not like to be embarrassed. And they're very kind of self-conscious about making a mistake. Since I'm not a minister, I have none of those reservations. <laughs> So I just put myself out there. Yeah, I screwed up. I'll go ahead and learn from that. Hey, Brother Mike did something stupid tonight. Let's not repeat that in our group. So then I'm ministering through my anointed stupidity. Very few ministers are at that level of skill to be able to minister through stupidity. That's an anointing few people have. Then I might do something right. Okay. Well, then sometimes the staff gets flustered with something. Do uh, you know what it is? Uh, they, it's called uh, people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're a mechanic or something like that, or you're working aerospace, or you're, okay, that's, that's an easy job, okay, because you're working with material things. You're an uh, Uber driver. That's tougher than a UPS driver. Not physically. Because the packages don't have personalities. And if you're a pastor of a church, uh, <laughs> people, people can be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes my staff is trying to minister to somebody and it's not going well. So I teach them to do that. Listen, if you went this direction with it, try a different direction. Go this, go, go this way, okay? If you say to them, uh, what do you want me to pray for? And they say, well, I've been praying and asking God to give me the next ticket on a space shuttle. Oh, okay, now that's not going to go well. So go the other direction here. Uh, 
Do you have any people you have bad feelings about? Well, yeah, I mean my mom my dad screwed me over my, my uncle raped me. Oh now now we now see you went this way here this aerospace prayer is not going to go far <laughs> But this one is going to lead to their miraculous deliverance Okay, so if you're struggling in one area with a person for deliverance Take a t different approach to it You've got to learn to be a little flexible like Ali you got to move around on your feet and be a little bit flexible as Opposed to just having it done your way which rarely works yeah. People are very complicated at times yeah? and they require enormous amounts of patience and they require some love yeah? And you got to not take stuff personal. Okay? So I've been given the numerous times. Okay? Don't even remember them anymore. Why? I don't take it personal. You don't take anything personal. Because the devil is dying for you. He's begging you to take it personal. He wants you to take it personal. That way he can destroy you. You want to lose your ministry? Anybody know how to do that real quickly? I'll give you, I'll, I'll, might as well just throw this in. Why not teach on it? If you like to ruin your ministry and you want to get out of the ministry quickly, take an offense at somebody who criticizes you. Put that in your hat. There you go. That's your tidbit of the night. How to get out of your ministry. What kind of a Bible study is this? No matter what happens you cannot take stuff personal and That includes from the devil He will bring somebody to you to call you every name in the book and That just rolls off you like it's nothing. You don't even feel it Now that was a wishful statement <laughs> If you start taking offenses you're going to start recycling demons. You know why? That's an open door for them to get back in. You could go through deliverance here for an hour, and if you take an offense at somebody, they'll start getting back in. That's why Jesus said in John 16, I told you all these things so you would not become offended. Hmm? So this is what it is. They said, hey, we can't get in this way. We're going to go around this way. Let's go to the side. Go up the top to the roof. Right? Yeah, what are we looking at here? They couldn't bring him in because of the crowd. They went on top of the rooftop. And then they what? Took the tile up and lowered him down. Yeah. Why? They were expecting this guy to walk home. Nobody else who was disabled got healed that day. No, no other paralyzed people got healed. Nobody else came down through the ceiling. There was nobody else to get healed. Had there been 500 people lined up from there to South Jericho, right, waiting to get up on the roof to lower their disabled relative down there, there would have been 500 more people carrying their cot home. 500 more. But because the line was empty and nobody else had any expectations of a miracle from God, only one guy got healed. It could have been 500, only one. Why? Nobody expected anything to happen except one family. Cornelius got a miracle from God. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. They were prophesying why they expected God to do something They expected him to do it. You might have to have some perseverance, correct? Here's brother Jarius Hey He runs out to see Jesus, you know the story Please come home. My daughter's dying Put your hands on her. She'll live. He expects Jesus to heal her right while they're going home to get healed, guess who shows up? 
the people from the church. If you want your faith built up, sometimes going to church is the last place you need to be. Why bother to teach her anymore? He, she's dead. Here's your friends. The devil will always send you a rack of these people. They will come at you from your relatives, from your congregation, from your friends. Something will happen. Every time your expectations go to a certain level, Satan sees it. The devil sees it, and he says, what's the best way to stop that? Send them a bunch of these people, people who don't believe, people who are nitpickers, people who are unbelievers. Okay? You remember the story. Jesus came down on the mountain from the transfiguration, and he had the best day of his life. He gets down to the mountain, and what's going on? He's back in reality. Well, he can't be in a good mood. They're having a failed deliverance session. The scribes are asking the disciples a bunch of questions about deliverance. They're arguing about it. No, you do it this way. No, you say that. No, you anoint him over here. Oh, you use the water over here. Back and forth. And Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? What are, what's going on over there, he says. Why are you arguing with the disciples? What is happening here? And then the dad runs up. Remember that? He says, hey, I brought my son to your disciples, which triggered an arguing event, and nobody can get this deaf and dumb spirit out of here. And Jesus, just from the Mount of Transfiguration, have you ever been on a vacation and then got back the first day at work? You ever notice that? The first day back at work from vacation, you can't imagine the kooks walking up to you at work. Problems everywhere, and it's such a downer. Yeah, you used to, you were on a yacht. Remember that? <laughs> Remember that yacht trip you made? I mean, it was in your mind, but I mean, you were on a yacht. You were on a vacation. You were at, you were on a cruise. Remember that? And you're sitting there. There's the buffet. Oh, I, have you ever been on a cruise? Oh, yeah. Don't ever go on one. They're horrible. There's food everywhere, and there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do and there's food everywhere. You know what you do all the time? Oh, eat and go to the bathroom. It's horrible. You get back off the cruise. That was so much fun. Oh, unless you took your relatives. And you get back to work and boom, everything falls in your lap. Everything in the paperwork's back up. These people that were supposed to do that job didn't do it. The person who was supposed to cover it for you here wasn't there. Oh, my gosh. Welcome to Jesus' world. He comes down on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's back home in his glory for the first and only time until after he dies. And he comes back to this deliverance fight, a fight over deliverance. What was going on there? The more they argued about deliverance, the father's faith and expectations just went down. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't cast him out. Jesus said, how long am I going to be doing this? I understand, Lord. Bring the boy here. He said, Lord, if you can do anything, if you can help him, have mercy on him. Well, wait a minute. He says, if you can believe, translation, your expectations went down here. If you can bring them back up here, anything is possible. Anything. He says, Lord, I'm so down. I need help just to believe. That's a great prayer. That prayer works. Confessing you don't have enough faith to believe, that's the first step toward the road to recovery and victory. Yeah, pretending you're fine keeps you in bondage. Yeah, it's better just to admit it. It really is. It's better to admit you don't have it. I've done that. It's, it's, it's empowering. It takes the pressure off you. 
Yeah, these people are not going to help you. Jesus said, do not be afraid, only believe. What happened there? When these people came to him, nagging, saying negative things, his expectation level started going here. Brother Jarius. And then he looks back at the Lord and he says, raise it back up. If you don't expect anything, God's not going to do anything. You may have to fight, right? She did. You remember her? She had cervix cancer, dying. She spent all her money on doctors. Remember that? Yeah, poor thing. That was my doctor visit one day. I had, I had a nasal surgery. I had my nose kind of jacked up. I was an amateur boxer when I was young, which explains the other issues. <laughs> so then I'm going to get this nose fixed. And I go to the waiting room. If you notice here, there's not a lot of people there with real heavy expectations of good things happening. You happen to notice that? People who don't have any expectations, you can kind of see it in their body language. <laughs> your soul affects your body. Your mind affects your body. And these people are expecting nothing right? but, a, but a bill. And she, what, what did she do? Well, she pushes in behind, and Oculus is a mob. Jesus was being mobbed by people, and uh, she... Uh, comes in from behind him. She comes up behind him. See that? And she touches the hem of his garment. And she says, if I only touch his himatian, his robe, I will be sozo delivered. And then her pege dried up. What's a pege? <clears throat> and her mastics was gone. What's that? Well, that's this thing. Uh, a mastic was a whip the Romans developed and uh, it was made out of leather. This is leather here and these are bone chips from an animal here. So flagellum was shortened to flogging and when you whip somebody and you went like that, the bone chips ripped into the skin and then ripped back, and the chunks of you came out. Okay, and this is what they used on Jesus. As Isaiah said, uh, he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. It was these stripes, flogging, flagellum, that is your ticket to being healed. Right? And they called that a mastix, a whipping, a whipping, and then they transferred it to terminal diseases, and they said, oh, you're being flogged by cancer or whatever it was. And that's what she said. She was relieved of her mastic, her flogging, her cancer. Her pigate dried up. What is that? Anybody ever been out to Fountain Hills, Arizona? If you haven't been there, well, it's a beautiful place, kind of a man-made community. It's a really pretty environment, but they have a lake out there, and they have a a pagay. There's a fountain. So this is telling me, medically, she was in the final stages of her cancer because the blood was just flowing out. It wasn't dripping like it had been for years. So it must have been some kind of slowly progressing cancer that was eating her alive. And she made it just in time. Why? She expected to be healed. She expected to receive a miracle. She expected to be cured. Yeah? If you are around Christianity for too long and you're exposed to it too much, what happens to your expectations? They go down. Why is that? I just told you. If you go somewhere and you don't see anybody 
healed or delivered in four years and you've been attending that church for four years, you now have an expectation that when you go there, nothing's going to happen. Correct? That's how it works. That's true not only at church, but in anything you're involved in. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whatever it is. After you're in there for a long period of time, your expectations go down. It becomes common. I already know what's going to happen. That's why the churches have so few miracles. Nobody's expecting one. In fact, if you start expecting one, you're going to get in trouble. That's right. Have you ever had a new convert come into your church who was born again and has their first love? You ever seen one of them? Kind of aggravating, aren't they? They come into your church all excited about Christ. They love the Lord. They praise. If the pastors are smart, they target those people quickly. And they don't let them get exposed to the rest of the congregation. Why? They'll turn into one of them. They try to get them on the worship team or, you know, get them in a spot where they're going to positively affect people. Yeah. But unfortunately, a seven churches of revelation on that. What happens when you lose your first love? You've lost your expectations. That's what. Losing your first love is. You don't expect him to do anything. So you're, oh. I got to be helping somebody. Expectation is the key that opens the miracle door. Wow. This is real. A new convert who still has his first love doesn't know he's not supposed to believe any of that. So after a year or two in the church, they become a church congregant. Back in the 70s, the Jesus movement sprung out of Southern California. Anybody remember that at all? A powerful preacher, hundreds of them popped up in that movement. One of them is still around today, a guy named Mario Murillo. He's in Northern California. He popped up out of the Jesus movement back in the 70s in Southern California. Well, these Jesus people the church looked at as freaks. You know why? They expected God to do things and they were excited about it. Oh! Gag me with a spoon. These people were not embraced by the church in the 1970s. They were, they were too wild. They didn't fit into the system. Why? They were enthusiastic and they were expecting God to do great things. And he did. Remember back in the 70s during the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church? Catholic charismatics? Anybody remember any of that? You were too young. Well, back in the 70s, the Holy Ghost started trying to pick off some Catholics. And the Protestants thought the Catholics were hopeless. Well, the Holy Ghost whistled its way in there, and they started getting filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, not every Catholic worships Mother Mary. Not, not every Catholic does that. Okay? A, a lot of them do. Okay, yeah, and that's a big problem. But the Spirit of the Lord knows who's, who can move and who can't. And they had a charismatic renewal in California in the Catholic Church. They all started getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Anybody remember that? They started speaking in tongues all over the place. Everybody thought they were nuts. 
Yeah, see, if you're expecting something from God and you're excited about it, you don't fit into religion, church. You're an outcast. You're exceptional. You're different. You don't fit in. You haven't been indoctrinated yet. yet. You haven't been trained yet to be a nothing. You got to be trained to be nothing. You can't just fall into it. You got to be trained and encouraged and demonstrated to lose your fire for God. You don't just suddenly lose it. You get around people who don't have any and they influence you and you start conforming to that behavior pattern and suddenly you are gone. Dang. Well, that's depressing. It is depressing. Not for you because you're not going to do that tonight. Now listen, here's the truth. Okay, this verse is 100% true for people who expect him to do something. People who don't expect anything, this verse means nothing. It, it might, as well, might as well be something written out of a Jehovah Witness handbook. It's nothing. But people that actually have an expectation, God's going to do something. This verse really does strike home. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Raise your hand if you've ever had demons come out of you. Either somebody cast them out or you did it or something. How many of you did it? Okay. Do you see all them hands going up? Do you see all that? That was a lot. Now, raise them again if same people, the ones that didn't raise their hands, uh, don't raise your hand. If you, have, if you have any spirits left that need to go, raise your hand. You started out and did great. You see all them hands? All right. When you got here today, this was you. Right there. There you are. <laughs> one on the left. And now you're going to repent. And this is the new you. If Jesus said these words, closing with this. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? I will never leave thee or forsake thee. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's what he said. Right? Matthew 28. Okay. That's the other half. Now, if you had demons cast out of you, have ever had that, that is 100% proof positive that you have the anointing and you have the Holy Ghost because you can't cast demons out of somebody without it. That means you have the anointing. Has, any, has anybody here ever been divinely healed? I'm not talking about getting healed and God bless my surgery. I'm talking about just a miraculous healing. Look at those hands that went up. You know what that proves? That proves you have the anointing for healing. You just haven't developed it. It's laying there in your spirit, man, ready to go, but it won't do anything unless you unless you encourage it and develop it. The fact that you had the Holy Spirit on you is evident you got de demons out and you got healed. That proves, that proves you have the Holy Ghost. You have the Spirit of God. You have the anointing for healing and deliverance. That proves it. And that proves that Christ is with you, and he said, I am never going to leave you, ever going to leave you. That if you had demons come out or you got healed, that proves you have the Holy Ghost, you have Christ, you have the anointing, and you still have it. Because he said, I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. That proves it. Oh, come on, Mike, really? Yeah, really. Yeah, really, I can prove it. Right? 